I want to thank Beth uh, when she contacts me and asks me if um, uh, I would like to speak at this time of the year because I always want to find something new or different and I want to stretch myself in some cases and uh, come up with something uh, and delve into areas that I haven't really delved into. Now I've done a lot with women's history um, in Kalamazoo, not uh, as much as what I'd like, but I remember when I used to work at the Public Museum, which about 30 years ago, and I remember working on my first exhibit on women's history. And it was a small portable exhibit, and that was my first introduction uh, to some of the women who have played such an important role in the history of Kalamazoo. Um, I also want to mention that if you are interested in women's history or if you're interested in Kalamazoo history in general, make sure that you go over to the museum. They've got their exhibit called, I want to say, Kalamazoo Gals, which is about women working in the Gibson plant, and that's going to be there until April 10th. It's in the gallery on the first floor, um, so make sure you see that. I get a lot of help from the, uh, my fellow public historians here, and I appreciate the help that I've received from Beth and of course the support I get from uh, my director Sharon Carlson who hears a lot of uh, what I'm talking about and also other friends in the audience Cheryl Lyon Jeunesse who had a little input. Another person who really helped me is somebody that you might know who worked here and still continues to work here Catherine Larson uh, who was the local history librarian previous to Beth uh, when she received the position and I worked with Catherine when I was at the museum and she was at the library. And so this is something that we've talked about for a long, long time. And uh, when I knew I was doing a program like this, I, um, Catherine already had a list together, uh, which she submitted to me. And uh, I'm going to share with her the fact that I do have some of the names from that list that is on that program, uh, that's in the program this evening. The other thing Catherine mentioned to me uh, when I was just such a, a young museum curatorial assistant, uh, when you're doing this with women's history, and that is not to forget the maiden name. And so you'll notice this evening that when I'm describing these women, when I could, I have not, their, not only their married name, but also their maiden name included. Because when you're looking at women's history, that's the part that, one of the parts that you don't want to forget, because that is um, a very big part of their life. And we've got two women included here that uh, it's very interesting how they handled their name. And I uh, didn't have to worry about their maiden name as part of it because um, they made it a part of their life as they, as they went on. Please also understand that this is a work in progress. Uh, I don't think any historian can say that they have the definitive history. Uh, you might have some input yourself. If you have any questions, I certainly would like to uh, hear them as we go by. So I'll be able to take advantage of all the wonders of modern technology. Let me just make sure that uh, I, I aim it in the right direction. Not only am I mic'd, but I'm also portable now, which is really nice. So when you come up with a title for a program like this, this was the one that I thought of the most, Fascinating Kalamazoo Women. Now, we do know a lot about the men of Kalamazoo, uh, written in the newspapers, written in books. The book over on the left-hand side actually is not just men of Kalamazoo, it's men of Michigan. And this, was, this came out in 1904. We know a lot about men, the men of Kalamazoo and of Michigan, because a lot of, was written about in the county histories that came out after 1876, after the centennial. But what we know about the women, it's certainly things have changed and there have been more things that have written about them. The book that I have in the lower right hand corner was one that came out in 1987 when we were celebrating the sesquicentennial of the state of Michigan. And this was a group of essays that were written by um, individuals. We have two of Kalamazoo women that are included in that. So we have seen in many of our lifetimes more and more that has been written, uh, performed, uh, presented, more information that's out there about Kalamazoo. Now when you talk about Kalamazoo women, these two really truly are the heavyweights in the area. And what my goal was today was to make sure that I didn't include them, with all due respect. Because Lucinda Hinsdale Stone, on the left-hand side, who came to Kalamazoo with her husband, Dr. J.A.B. Stone, was involved with Kalamazoo College, women's education, uh, women's clubs, the Ladies' Library Association. Um, and then you have Carolyn Bartlett Crane on the right-hand side. And, uh, but we'll find out that in, in this evening, some of the women that we're going to talk about obviously had some sort of encounters with these women. Carolyn Bartlett Crane, 
who came to Kalamazoo to become the minister of the First Unitarian Church, later known as the People's Church, a uh, progressive social reformer um, involved with suffrage causes, two very vibrant women. And both, I should say, have had books written about them. Now, the book on the left-hand side, Emancipated Spirits, this is the paperback copy, it's not just about Lucinda, but the chapter in there, written by Gail Griffin, uh, who was in Kalamazoo College in the English department, was probably one of the best chapters that I read about Lucinda. This also has three chapters. Uh, the three other chapters are about Frances Diebolt, who was in the science department at K College, um, also um, Nelda Balch, who was in the theater department, and Pauline Johnson, who had graduated from K College. But it's, very, it's a very, very good coverage of Lucinda. In the book on the right-hand side, written by Orion Rickard, about Carolyn Bartlett Crane, a just verdict. And there have been other articles and books that have been written about both of these women. And even in Michigan history, Kalamazoo is, is covered. Um, the most recent issue of Michigan history, this is the March-April issue, had an article about Olympia Brown from Kalamazoo County, specifically from the Prairie Ron Schoolcraft area, and was the first woman to become a minister. She was ordained um, in the Unitarian Church, and so there's a very, very nice article about her. This was somebody who made uh, Catherine's List. So there has been a lot, and there continues to be a lot, of uh, information written about women in uh, Kalamazoo and in Michigan. Well, the way I decided to approach it this evening is to look at some of these women in various categories. So our first category this evening is what I called settlement and early years. <sighs> Sally Bronson. Um, I feel sorry for Sally Bronson because the only picture that we really have of Sally Bronson is this painting. Now, it's not, this isn't a painting. This was a lithograph that was done of the original painting that is in the um, collections of the Kalamazoo Valley Museum. It's called Kalamazoo in 1832. It was done by Anthony Cooley. And this shows Titus Bronson, who is standing at the fence talking to uh, Dr. John, or Jonathan Abbott, who is the postmaster, also a doctor. You see the two cabins of uh, where the Bronsons were living. Um, Sally Bronson, the only illustration we have of Sally, is this woman right here milking the cow. Um, she's talking to Reverend Thomas Merrill, who's the circuit preacher for the Methodist Church. Um, this was a lithograph that was done a number of years later and then sold to people. Sally Bronson, of course, was married to this gentleman. This is Titus Bronson, and this is the painting that was done by Benjamin Cooley, who was the son of Anthony Cooley, and that is also in the uh, collections of the Kalamazoo Valley Museum. So what do we know about Sally? Because, you know, Titus gets all the credit on some cases, but what do we really know about Sally? Well, we know that uh, Sally Richardson, uh, Richardson Bronson, uh, we know that Titus was born in Middlebury, Connecticut. Uh, more than likely, Sally was also born in Connecticut. Um, Titus lived in Ohio. He also lived in Ann Arbor. Uh, he eventually came back to Connecticut and married Sally there, which makes me think that she, was in, uh, lives in Con that she lived in Connecticut. Uh, they were married on January 1st, 1827. Uh, now, with so many of the people who were living at that time who were coming over from uh, the east to the Midwest, to the Northwest, uh, they moved a lot. And with the Bronsons, though, after they got married, Titus moved to Talmadge, Ohio with Sally, and then he left to go back to Michigan. And so Sally was there um, by herself. Uh, they eventually had a daughter and then another daughter uh, when they moved. Uh, he did come back around 1820, well, 1829, he came here to this area that becomes known as Kalamazoo. 1830, he goes and back to Ohio and gets Sally um, and their daughter and uh, Sally's brother, Stephen Richardson, and brings them up here. Now, between 1830 and 1831, during that winter, uh, they were living with Basil Harrison and his family, Basil and Martha Harrison, who lived in Prairie Ronde. And then in 1831, uh, the cabins were built, um, and that's where the Bronsons lived. Now, the current location of those is where the West Michigan Cancer Center is located now, on the corner of Water and North Park Street, uh, near Arcadia Creek. Um, and legend has it that Titus Bronson was the one who named the creek Arcadia Creek. So this was the Bronson homestead. The thing that Titus did is he went to the federal land office to buy about 160 acres, which is now what we know as the village of Bronson. But for some reason that isn't written anywhere, he put it in Sally's name. 
And so Sally's name was on the deed. Now, what was the advantage of doing that? I really don't know. Like I said, this is a very fluid program in process, and we may not know what the reasons were for that. Um, there are some things that have been written about Sally. Nick Hekic, who wrote the book A Fine Place for a City, which was a, a biography of Titus Bronson, talks about that Sally was known as a wife who had a good business sense. Um, she was called a smartish, whatever that means, I'm assuming it's smart, sort of woman who was a little inclined to dictate. The famous story was that uh, they said she was, uh, there was one day when she was probably telling Titus a little bit more than what he wanted to hear, and it was said that he took off, they called him his pantaloons or his pants, and has said to say to Sally, take them, take them, whatever. Um, he, at one time, was ready to give up his claim. This was early in the years of the village. This was probably um, 1831, 1830, 1831. He was ready to give up his claim uh, for a gun um, and $100. And Sal, according to the story, Sally got mad and reminded him whose name was specifically on the deed. And so the sale ended. Um, but with so much in the history of the Bronsons, they would move, and in 1836, for reasons specifically unknown. However, if you do read some of the information out there, they say because he was not happy that they changed the name of the village from Bronson to Kalamazoo, whether that was the reason or not, if it was just this wanderlust that Titus had, because I think he, his village was beginning to grow a little bit too much. They did move eventually to Illinois and then eventually to Iowa. Um, so Sally Bronson. Deborah Harris, uh, Enoch and Deborah Harris, who were also uh, some of our first settlers here in Kalamazoo. Um, they were, uh, Enoch was born in Virginia. Uh, Deborah was born in uh, Pennsylvania. They married in 1812. They moved to Ohio and then eventually came to Ashtamo Township around 1829. As with most people who came to Kalamazoo County, they were farmers. Um, we know that the Harrises had uh, eight children. So obviously Deborah's life was involved very much with the raising of their children. The other thing that the Harrises did was bring the first apple seeds to the area and planted what was known as the first apple orchard. Um, and so Deborah and Sally were very typical of so many of the women that came with their husbands, that they came to Kalamazoo. Uh, they were wrapped up with their housework, their taking care of the family, um, and also supporting uh, the husband in any way that they could. Pamela Thomas. Now you hear a lot about Nathan Thomas and Schoolcraft from the Underground Railroad. Um, this is a picture we have in the collection um, at uh, the archives at Western Michigan University. This was taken when she was 63 years old and Pamela was born in 1817. So you're looking at probably about 1880 is when this picture was taken. Um, long after um, probably one of the major events that happened in Pamela's life. Um, Pamela came to Schoolcraft in 1833 from Vermont. She was 16 years old. Uh, the next year she started teaching in Prairie Rond. Uh, she married Dr. Nathan Thomas in 1840. Uh, now she knew that Dr. Thomas was involved with the Underground Railroad. Uh, Dr. Thomas was a Quaker. And the house, I know it's very blurry, but the house that we have here is the Underground Railroad house in Schoolcraft. But it's not on its original location. It was located in the, mil in the middle of the village um, on the site of where the Thomas's Italianate was built after the war. So it really was in the middle of the village. Uh, it's been estimated that between 1840 and 1860, the Thomases helped approximately 1,500 fleeing slaves um, to Canada and other points. The reason why we know a lot about it is, or we not, not know a lot, but we know a little about and what their life was like is because of Pamela. Um, Dr. Thomas did write his autobiography. It's a very small um, pamphlet, booklet type, type of the publication. But there's very little. He really, I don't think, wrote anything in there about his involvement with the Underground Railroad. But tucked in the back was a recollection that Pamela wrote about what it was like. Um, she talks about um, knowing that he was involved with this, what it was like, uh, when people would come. She talks specifically about some of the slaves that came through. Uh, talks about the reaction of some of her um, acquaintances who found out that she was involved with this and what their reactions were. 
Um, one specifically said that they don't think that they could do that, talking about how they'd have to gather food. And meanwhile, of course, she's raising her family while this is going on in a very, very small house. Um, we're grateful that we have that because it does give us at least a little bit of insight as to what her life was like um, until the time of the Civil War. So Pamela Thomas. Now one of those individuals that came through the Thomas house is this woman right here, Dorothy Butler. Uh, Dorothy Butler was born in Kentucky. She was a slave. Her mother was a slave and her father um, was a white owner in Kentucky. Uh, she had an older sister named Sophie. And uh, they decided, the mother had overheard the fact that he, at least maybe one of the daughters was going to be sold. And so they escaped on the Underground Railroad and found their way to the Thomas home about 1855. Um, now they decided to stay in Schoolcraft. Um, they did not move on uh, to the east to go into Canada. And Dorothy, uh, Dorothy and her mother lived with the Duncans in Schoolcraft and their sister lived with a, another member of the Duncan family. And Dorothy continued to work as a housekeeper, well, she worked as a housekeeper and a cook for several families in the Kalamazoo area. And uh, it, it's really great because she is now in a chapter in a new book that came out last year called Great Girls in Michigan History uh, that was recently published. It was written by a woman who is the editor of the Michigan History magazine. And it's designed for probably maybe a young adult audience there. And Dorothy Butler is in there and she was part of Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo and Kalamazoo County history. Education. Um, this is a photo we have in our collection and this is a uh, class from Lovell Street School. I'm assuming seventh grade or maybe not seventh grade, it says room number seven. And when you look at the field of education, women played such a big role um, in a lot of different ways, whether they be teachers or administrators or um, superintendents or supervisors. And um, we have two examples right here. We have Eliza Coleman over in the left-hand side, actually Eliza Coleman Seymour, who was the first teacher in the village of Bronson. The school opened up around 1833. It was located on the corner of East South Street and what used to be Henrietta, but is now known as John Street. Um, and uh, one of the challenges that Eliza had is that not only did she have school going on, but she had to share the space with the court and also with a church and also with the debating society called the Lyceum. Um, in the right hand side we have a picture of Florence Winslow from the Winslow family. And the Winslow family was a, a very deep pioneering family in Kalamazoo. Her grandfather George Washington Winslow came to the area in 1835. Um, he left to go to California and try to make his fortune in the gold rush um, and eventually came back and started a marble works business. Um, Florence was so typical of so many, uh, so many of the women out there that went into education. Uh, born in Kalamazoo, graduated from Kalamazoo High School around, I want to say, 1901. Uh, graduated from Kalamazoo College in 1906 and eventually started working at the Kalamazoo Public Schools in 1913 at Kalamazoo Central. She taught math. She was an assistant principal until her retirement in 1946. Now she had a good role model because her aunt Harriet George's daughter also taught in the Kalamazoo Public Schools earlier than Florence, of course. Harriet um, graduated from high school in 1871 and she graduated from the University of Michigan in 1875 and then spent her career teaching math um, at uh, Kalamazoo High School. Some other people, I told you I'd get Lucinda back in here some way. Um, now this is a very faded photo, not a faded photograph, it's a very blurry photograph but it's one of the few images that we have of this woman. When you talk about education, Madeline Stockwell Turner. Um, Madeline Stockwell was born in Albion, Michigan. Uh, her father was the head of what was called the Wesleyan Seminary, which later became Albion College. And uh, after he passed away, her mother married uh, Dr. William Johnson. And uh, she, had, she came from a family where education, especially women's education, was very important. And uh, she was educated at the seminary. And when she came to Kalamazoo in 1864, of course, I have to throw this photo in of this house because this is the Johnson home on Woodward Avenue. And this is the house that Dr. Johnson built in 1864 for his family. Not only was there um, his wife, uh, but also uh, Madeline and Dr. Johnson's daughter from an earlier marriage, um, Elizabeth. So they lived in this house. 
Well, when Madeline came to Kalamazoo, uh, she started working with Lucinda Hinsdale Stone uh, and started uh, uh, going to school uh, and was educated by the Stones. And Lucinda, at this time in the 1860s, maybe even earlier than that, I know Sharon can give me maybe an approximate date on, not approximate date, but approximate time. Lucinda was really, really interested in women being allowed to enter the University of Michigan. And she worked on it very strongly for many, many years. And finally, in 1870, it was agreed that women could enter the University of Michigan. And so Lucinda recommended her student, Madeline Stockwell. And Madeline entered in 1870, February of 1870. And uh, it has said that she impressed the male students with her uh, uh, knowledge of Latin. Um, and she was there. She graduated in June of 1872. Now, she may have been the first. And there are stories of her walking through the quad at Michigan and having everybody stare at her because it was a very unique situation to have a woman there, a woman student, at the university. Um, by the time the, the next, let's see, she arrived in February. And by June of 1870, by fall of 1870, there were 33 other girls were registered. So she was the first, but there were many more that followed her. Um, Madeline graduated in 1872, and in the next year, she married uh, one of her classmates, Charles Turner, and they com came back and lived in this house. Uh, she taught at Kalamazoo College. She was also involved with organizations like the Ladies' Library Association, um, and she passed away in 1924. So another example of education. Another example of education, another example of a woman involved with education in Kalamazoo uh, somebody who's in the Michigan Hall of Fame, Merce Tate. Now, Merce Tate was not born in Kalamazoo, but she came here um, to attend Western State Teachers College. Uh, she was born near Mount Pleasant, uh, graduated from Battle Creek High School, and she originally came to Western, got her teaching diploma, uh, left, taught for a year, but then came back to get her bachelor's degree, and she graduated in 1927. Up to that point, she had, in 1927, so the school had opened up uh, 20 plus years earlier, she had the school's highest academic record. She had 45 A's and six B's. But she could not find a job. She, she wanted to teach high school. She couldn't find a job because in 1927, no, public, no high school in Michigan was hiring African American teachers. So through the help of Dr. Dwight Waldo, the president, uh, Bertha Davis, the Dean of Women, and also John Hokey, the Registrar, they did what they could to help her look for jobs out of state. They loaned her money. She looked at uh, several different schools and, and finally settled on Crispus Attucks High School in Indianapolis, Indiana. But that was not the end of her career. Um, she eventually got her master's from Columbia she also um, was the first black woman to enter Oxford and the first black to earn an advanced degree. She also earned a, was the first African-American woman to earn a doctoral degree from Radcliffe and Harvard. Uh, she authored seven books. Her one of her specialties was foreign policy. Uh, she taught at colleges in North Carolina, in Maryland, and she also taught at Howard University. And she was there until she retired in 1977. She did not forget Western. Uh, Western benefited uh, from her generosity in a couple different ways. Uh, she um, endowed, she gave money for a center in the College of Education. She also endowed two medallion scholarships. And a year, several years before she passed away, she also gave a million dollars to the university. So she was, um, did a lot in supporting Western. I sort of squeeze this in with education, because when you're looking at a library, yes, you've got to look at pleasure, but you also have to look at education. And here we have Flora Roberts. Flora Roberts um, came to Kalamazoo to uh, um, work at the Kalamazoo Public Library, and she, one of the things that she did in 1918 is she wanted to professionalize um, the library. So she did a lot to... Um, she wanted to recatalog all the books. I'm not quite sure if she did that or not, but she really did want to professionalize the library. Now, the library itself had been around much earlier than 1918. It actually got started in the 1850s uh, when it was a school library, and it became a public library in, the 18, in 1872. Um, and so by the time that Flora came here, it had been in operation as a public library for a number of years. But she did a lot to not only professionalize um, the collection, 
professionalized the staff. She offered uh, library classes for the staff to take. She also did a lot when it comes to publicizing the library. Um, as far as getting word out in the newspaper, as far as the books that are there, um, also getting the information out about programming that was happening. And also, there is a wonderful movie that if you get onto the library YouTube channel, there's a movie that was done in 1939 about the library. And Flora Roberts was behind that. Now, she was also involved. The reason why I have these pictures, now here is the library building that was completed uh, in the 1890s on the corner of South and Rose Street. But then she was also there. She, she knew when she got there almost immediately that she said that there needed to be some expansion of the building. Um, they didn't expand the building while she was there, and she was director until the early 1940s. But they did buy property to the south. Um, in this picture, you can see uh, this is the coffer home on the corner of Rose and Lovell Street. And then just to the left, you can see a little bit of the Peck home which became the site of the Kalamazoo Museum. Now the Kalamazoo Museum had started, or the museum department of the library had started in around 1881, but by the early, by the mid, by 1927, they were in this house right here. And then this one right here, uh, the art department from the library was located there. And then this was also one of the early homes of what became known as the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. So Flora was around for not only the professionalism, the professionalizing, if I can make a word up like that, of the library, but also she was around for the expansion of the library too, so Flora Roberts. Now, healthcare. If you look at the history of healthcare in Kalamazoo as far as with women goes, these are two names that always pop up, and these were two pictures that appeared um, a number of years ago, Dr. Rush McNair, who had been a longtime physician in Kalamazoo, uh, wrote articles in the Kalamazoo Gazette that were then put into a book called Medical Memories. And one of the articles he wrote about were about these two women, Matilda Towsley and Dr. Della Pierce. Matilda Towsley started in 1869, Della Pierce started in 1893. These were some of the, um, so several of the women physicians that were here in Kalamazoo. So we hear a lot about Dr. Towsley, we hear a lot about Dr. Pierce, but we don't hear too much about Dr. Helen Upjohn Kirkland. Um, to talk about Dr. Kirkland, though, you do have to look at her family. Uh, Dr. Uriah Upjohn and his wife, Mariah Mills Upjohn. Uh, Dr. Upjohn, Uriah Upjohn, was born in England, came to America in 1828, uh, became a doctor in New York in 1834, uh, came to Michigan a year later, and received his license to practice uh, a couple years after that. Uh, Mariah was born in New York, came to Gull Prairie uh, when, in 1831, so she was here uh, before Uriah came, um, and uh, they got married in 1837. And, between, and the two of them, they had 12 children, so they had a nice large uh, family. They always talk about Uriah having an interest in, in education, but I'm sure it was also the mother that also had an interest in education too. And in 1869, Uriah wanted to send um, eight of his children to Ann Arbor to uh, do some, either go to Michigan or go to, some of the, uh, uh, go to some of the other schools that were around there. Well, we know a lot about the Upjohn men. And we've got, for example, we've got Dr. Henry Upjohn here who graduated from the University of Michigan Medical School. We have Dr. William E. Upjohn who also graduated from the medical school as did his brother, Dr. James, James Towsley Upjohn. Down here, this is Frederick Upjohn. Now, all four of them, of course, were involved with the Upjohn Company at various time periods. But what I've always found interesting are the, also the Upjohn sisters. Now, many, some, several of these did go to Ann Arbor uh, with the rest of the family. Up here, we have Alice, and we're just gonna spend a very brief time on some of these, but I do find it interesting. Alice right here, she went to Ann Arbor, and what she did she went to the Michigan State Normal School, which is now Eastern Michigan University. She went there, of course, to take uh, courses to become a teacher. Down here we have Amelia, Amelia Upjohn Campbell. Amelia and her sister Mary right here, they decided in 1870, ironically enough, to go to the pharmacy school in Ann, um, as part of the University of Michigan. Um, Amelia, had, when she first went to Ann Arbor, she graduated from Ann Arbor High School. Uh, and uh, then she and her sister 
went into the pharmacy school, one of the things that Mary said years later the reason why they did that is because it was only a year program and they were out within a year. I don't think we have any evidence that either of them actually practiced as pharmacists, although, although pharmacy was something that was in their family, not so much with their father Uriah, uh, but they also had uh, W.E. Upjohn, their brother, worked for a pharmacist, Dr. Babcock, in Kalamazoo, but they did that. And then up here we have Ida. Ida went to high school in Ann Arbor. And then over here we, in the corner, we have Sarah, uh, who uh, I don't think, I don't know if she went to Ann Arbor or not. I haven't found any evidence of that. But who was running the ship in Ann Arbor in that house? It was Helen. Helen was the oldest of the Upjohn uh, brothers and sisters. And so when her father decided to send uh, the majority of the children to Ann Arbor to either finish their high school, go on to the Michigan State Normal School, or go on to Michigan, Helen was the one that was taking care of the house. Helen had been educated in Richland. She had gone to Kalamazoo College. She had actually taught both in Richland and Iowa. And uh, when she went to uh, Ann Arbor, she was about 30 years old at the time, and uh, she uh, was involved with uh, giving chores to everybody who was there. Not only did they have the eight children, but they also had cousins that joined them in this house and a number of boarders. And in September of 1870, not long after uh, Madeline Stockwell had entered Michigan, Michigan was going to allow the first class of women to go to medical school, and Helen decided to go. Um, her sponsor was her father, Uriah. It took her probably two years to complete the program. She graduated in 1872. She did some practice in Boston and New York before she came back to Kalamazoo, and uh, in about 1870, uh, early, eight, well, probably about 1873, 18, well, about 1873, she's practicing medicine in Kalamazoo with her brother Henry and her father Uriah. Now, what I find interesting about Helen is that throughout the newspapers, um, well, she eventually, she gets married in 1875 to a gentleman named Hugh Kirkland, who was a farmer in the Richland area, but subsequently in the newspaper after her marriage, she is known as Helen Upjohn Kirkland, or she is Dr. Helen Upjohn Kirkland. So she kept that middle name in there. Now, I don't know, did she do that because of the family connection? Um, was there a pattern? I don't know if there was a pattern of, their, of her sisters to do that, but I just thought that was really, really interesting. Um, Hugh Kirkland um, was a widower. Um, he had been a farmer. He must have been a very, very prosperous farmer because in 1839, the value of his land was $3,000, and this is 1839 in those early years. Um, they, um, by the time they got married, he was no longer farming. Uh, he was a businessman, and so they were living on Main Street uh, where she had her practice. Uh, she was listed as a physician until 1897, um, and she passed away in 1901. Now, if you've ever gone on the uh, cemetery tours that I do in Mountain Home Cemetery, the thing I always say is that I always feel bad because when you look at the tombstones in the Upjohn family plot, um, the brothers all have MD after their names, the ones that are doctors, Helen does not. Um, and that may have just been the way that, that things happened, but I always feel that, that there's a loss there because here we have a woman who, who really had quite a career um, as a doctor and she was involved with the Academy of Medicine and, and uh, was well known, so Helen up John Kirkland. Women played a role in so many of the other medical health care institutions that we have in Kalamazoo. Uh, of course, many of you, the Borges Hospital, are aware of the role that the Sisters of St. Joseph played um, in the creation of this hospital. Um, down here we have Bronson. Now this picture is taken in the 1920s, so you have the early building that was built in 1905 and the addition that was put in the uh, mid-1920s. With Bronson, you had a situation where in 1896, you had a group of doctors that wanted to create a non-religious um, institution as opposed to Borges Hospital, which of course was the Catholic Church. And so um, uh, they uh, created the Kalamazoo Hospital. And uh, you had a women's auxiliary that in 1901 raised money for the construction of the hospital building by doing such things as having dancers, concerts, bazaars, they ran the streetcars, they cut hair in the barber shop. Um, the building opened in 1905, and I found it interesting that between 1902 and 1907, on the board for, it was the Kalamazoo Hospital, later known as Bronson Hospital, there were 10 women and five men. So women had the majority of the board members. Now what was the power of the board? I'm really not too sure. 
but those are still impressive statistics. This actually comes from the archives. This comes from our collection. And this is a organization, when you talk about healthcare, that you really don't, I don't think you might not have be familiar with it. I don't think a lot of people are, but it's really interesting. It was called the Whatsoever Free Bed Association. <laughs> and it started in 1911, and there were some church women who were contacted by a Dr. Blanche Epler. Uh, and she was concerned because there were many people who needed health care but didn't have the means to pay for it. And so originally it set out, they actually had a bed at Bronson Hospital um, that was available for people. And then after that, they got rid of it because it was too much of a stigma to know that you were laying in the bed that was paid for by charity. Uh, but they raised money to help people. Um, they later helped with hospital bills and medical equipment. What you have here is a page from, oh, don't wanna go that far, a page of the records that we have at the archives and it looks at the contributions that women had made. Now, many of these women were associated with churches because when you look at um, where this money came from, it was funded by churches, contributions, and gifts, and bequests. Uh, some of the records go so far as to talk about you know, what they gave money for. Was there somebody who had a pregnancy? Somebody, you know, for a lot of different reasons. So the whatsoever free bed association. This category I call community, civic leaders, activists, and organizations. Now, of course, I had, see, here you go. See, I tell you, I wanted to stay away from Lucinda and Caroline. You still got to put them in in some way. Um, Carolyn Bartlett Crane, that's another thing we have at the archives. We have the Carolyn Bartlett Crane uh, papers, and that's such a wonderful collection, uh, really reflective of her total life. Uh, a woman who, as I mentioned to you, was involved, came here, to head the uh, People's Church, and we have some people here from the People's Church, um, but also uh, was involved in her ministry for the first, uh, we have a household classes for girls, we have manual training for boys, there was also a public kin or a kindergarten that was at the church. Uh, the building was located, if you're not familiar, on the corner of Lovell and Park Street. Uh, the other thing that Carolyn was involved with, as some of the other women that we will talk about in this um, area here, um, involved with creation of organizations such as the Women's Civic Improvement League. And you may not be able to see it too much, but this was a notice that was out here, it was talking about keeping your street clean because that was something that they were all very, very interested in. So we know a lot about Caroline. There's other people too that were involved with this, like this woman here. This is Caroline Hubbard Kleinstuck. Um, Caroline, um, was born in Kalamazoo. She was the daughter of Silas and Mary Loomis Hubbard, educated at Kalamazoo High School. And she also, well, she was gonna go to Vassar, but then she found out that she could go to the University of Michigan. So she went there in 1871, graduated four years later, and the next year received a master's degree. She was the first woman to receive a master's degree from the University of Michigan. After graduation with her master's, uh, she and uh, some other individuals, um, a woman who was a teacher of hers, went off to Europe for a couple years. And while she was there out in Europe, receiving further education, she met the Kleinstuck family, specifically their son, Carl Kleinstuck, and uh, fell in love. And they came back to the United States and uh, eventually got married uh, in 1883. Uh, they moved to Chicago for a couple years. Carl was an engraver, but they came back to Kalamazoo and they bought this, up. Oh, gotta know which ones to do it. They bought this piece of property here, here's their house, which still exists on Oakland Drive, just to the south of Maple Street. Uh, there's a field stone fence in front of it. They originally started, uh, they were doing poultry and dairy, and eventually Carl got into also the peat business. Um, the Hubbard family was very connected to the First Unitarian Church. In fact, Silas Hubbard had given um, an amount of money for the construction of a new building, which was that church that I, I showed you previous. And so she became, Carolyn Kleinstuck became very close to Carolyn Crane. And one of the things that's in the collection, uh, the Crane collection, um, is a um, reminiscent re uh, uh, words, um, a recollection that Carolyn wrote about the life of Carolyn Hubbard Kleinstock. Um, in the picture here, what we have is we have Carl is here, Carolyn is here, and here are two of their daughters, and here's their son right here. 
I can't tell if Pauline is there or not. They ended up having four children. Caroline was very active, not only with her husband's business, but also with the People's Church. Uh, she was involved with Caroline in the founding of the, the Women's Civic Improvement League, the 20th Century Club. She was involved with suffrage, the League of Women Voters, the Douglas Community Association. When you read the words that Caroline Crane wrote about her friend, Caroline Kleinstuck, it was pretty amazing. She talked about how Caroline Kleinstuck pioneered the fight for kindergartens in Kalamazoo. It started at the People's Church, but then eventually they wanted it integrated within the public school system. And Caroline Bartlett Crane talked about how during the vote to get approval for kindergartens in Kalamazoo, Caroline actually stood at the polls trying to convince school voters to accept the proposal. I don't know if people would have been able to do that now, but Mrs. Kleinstuck was doing that back then. Uh, she helped with those household science and those manual training programs. Uh, it also said that what she began were at the, when they had the kindergartens at the People's Church, she began what were um, meetings with the parents that then started into the beginnings of our parent-teacher conferences in schools. Um, her mother uh, paid for the women's gymnasium at People's Church, and Caroline Kleinstuck worked at, uh, there's another service they had at the People's Church, which was called the Evening Rest for Working Women, where they provided suppers and a place for women who worked all day in the factory to have a place that they could go. So she was very, very actively involved. Um, one of the things that she did uh, in the 1920s and 1922, Carolyn Kleinstock gave a 48-acre tract of land to the State Board of Education known as Kleinstock Preserve. So Caroline Kleinstock. Now, education though and community involvement was something that she continued with her children. And in fact, when you look at the involvement of women and women and organizations, a lot of when you look at what women were able to accomplish in the in the 19th century and into the 20th century, it was through such organizations, some of which that I already mentioned. And what Caroline Kleinstock did actually then transferred to her daughters and her daughter-in-law. Um, I don't have photographs of them. I'll just have newspaper clippings. This was a newspaper clipping that came out in 1949 when there was a hall that was named for Caroline Hubbard Kleinstock was dedicated. But in this photograph, you've got three of Caroline's daughters. You've got uh, Mrs. Paul Ealing right here, uh, Frida, Klein, uh, Frida Kleinstuck Blankenberg, Blankenberg here, and then Irene Kleinstuck right here. Um, this is Mrs. Otto Ealing. So you've got three right here. In, of the four women, you've got uh, three of Caroline's daughters. Um, they, when you look at them, all of them went to the University of Michigan. In fact, all four of um, Caroline's children went to, Caroline and Carl's children went to the University of Michigan. Irene right here graduated in, um, went to the University of Michigan, became involved with a number of organizations in Kalamazoo. Frida not only got her bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, but she also got a law degree uh, from the University of Michigan. Uh, she later married and uh, her husband was a lawyer. In fact, they met at law school and then became a judge. Um, the other thing, this is another picture of uh, Frida Blankenberg right here because not only was she involved with a number of organizations, she was one of the founders of the Kalamazoo chapter of the American Red Cross, but she was the second woman to be elected to the Kalamazoo City Commission in the 1930s. Um, and she was also involved with the creation of the Child Guidance Clinic. And then Pauline uh, Ealing also went to the University of Michigan and was involved with a variety of organizations. We've got some other people that were involved with organizations, Florence Mills, Florence Mills, Florence Balch Mills, uh, who was born in Berry County, married to Alfred Mills, a lawyer, and she was active with, again, the list is endless, the numbers of organizations that she was involved with. Yes, the Ladies Library Association, uh, the Kalamazoo County Federation of Women's Clubs, the Women's Civic Improvement League. You see a pattern here with these women, where they were going with this. She was involved with the Merrill Home for Old Ladies, the Douglas Community Board, and the State Federation of Women's Clubs, just to mention a few. Florence also went into um, elective office. 
she was elected to the Kalamazoo Board of Education. The other thing I forgot to mention about Madeline Stockwell Turner is that she graduated, or she also, it is also said that she ran for the school board, but I haven't found any evidence of that yet, but Florence was on the school board. And another woman in this category, Cornelia Robinson. Cornelia Robinson was born in Ohio. She received degrees both from Hiram College and Columbia. She came to Kalamazoo with her husband, William McKinley Robinson. He was a professor in the Rural Life and Education Department at Western Michigan University. Cornelia, to say that she was busy was an understatement, and her community involvement list, again, was endless. Her elective office, she served three terms on the city commission, two terms, uh, wasn't elected, but she was appointed to the city planning commission. She was also on the county board of supervisors. She was the first female chair of the county board, and she was also elected to the Michigan State Board of Education. She was the first woman president. She was on the board of a number of organizations, anywhere from the YWCA to the Red Cross. And another organization that she was involved with, in 1931, she chaired the committee that was called, that established the Birth Control League. It was aimed specifically at, at women who were poor, indigent, to get them information about birth control. They did receive uh, financial support from the community chest, which would be today's United Way. Um, it did close in the 1940s, but it was the early beginnings of Planned Parenthood in Kalamazoo, and this was back in 1931. As far as organization goes, the Ladies' Library Association, wonderful organization, still in existence. They have had many, um, several books written about them, and it's a coincidence that I have this one on the screen because I have one of the authors of that in the audience this evening, Cheryl Lyon Jeunesse, who is working on another research on the Ladies' Library Association. Um, so the Ladies' Library Association, and then I also have Sharon Carlson, my director, who wrote her di doctoral dissertation, so I'm not even going to talk about the Ladies' Library Association, because it has been talked about before, and I've got two very big experts over here. In fact, I may have some members of the Ladies' Library Association, so I'm not getting into that. But let's look at some of the other organizations. The YWCA. The YWCA it began in Kalamazoo in 1885. It is the oldest state chapter of a YWCA in the state of Michigan. It started off with nine girls that gathered to study the Bible. Um, they rented rooms in the downtown area. Specifically, they rented rooms in a building that I call the Humphrey Block. It's the building on the corner of Portage and East Michigan. It's where the Peninsula Brew Pub is. Um, and so they rented rooms there. And then eventually, uh, they got some money and they were able to purchase a home on West Main Street for their headquarters. They did so much, not only for the, for the girls who were here who wanted to gather to have discussions about the Bible and other religious subjects, but one of the reasons I put them in here is because one of the th when you look at what they did in the last half of the 19th century and into the 20th century, the services they provided to the women who were working in Kalamazoo. Um, for example, they fed, they provided lunch and dinner for these women. Uh, they provided ways for them to further their education. They met daily train, they met the daily trains, would greet women, would provide information for them about directions, employment. Um, not in this space, obviously, but in their house that they had on West Main Street, which was approximately just a little bit, if, if not across the street, not directly across the street from the federal building, but just a tiny, tiny bit to the west. They even provided temporary rooms that they would rent at, for example, 350 a week for women. So they really provided a service, not only for the people who were here, but also the women who were here that were working long hours and the women who were coming in and needed some help to find out where they go, the YWCA. And another organization, the Kalamazoo Business and Professional Women's Club. Now, one of the things I want to say is that so many of these, women or these, these women's organizations, fortunately for us, a lot of these records are in existence at the archives. We put together, Sharon and I did a presentation for the Osher Lifelong uh, Institute last year, year before, somewhere around there, and uh, recently, I think it was a year ago. Uh, anyway, and we, have a, we put together a long list of collections that we have at the archives from these women's organizations like this group the Kalamazoo Business and Professional Women's Club, which started in 1920. 
Um, it was the first club of professional and business women. They were involved with a variety of things. Yes, they had meetings, but they also did a lot of philanthropy. They supported a lot of organizations like Girl Scouts, uh, Pretty Lake Camp, a lot of organizations that, a lot of uh, programs that were out there. Um, they also sponsored speakers. They did fundraisers. They did presentations. Um, they also did debates. I don't know how this was handled. If they were on one side and if the students from the Western State Teachers College were on the other, I'm not sure who was involved with the debates. But one of the things that they debated, and I love this, this is in the 1920s. The question was, chain stores detrimental to the community? I love that one. Um, one, of the also, one of the things they also did is they encouraged their members to run for office. And they did what they could to encourage their members to run for political office. So this article right here, it's called The Gavel Falls, Women Commissioners, Are They Much Alike? What's interesting is when you look at these six photographs, is the majority of the women in these photographs were members of the Kalamazoo Business and Professional Women's Club. You've got Frida Blankenberg, Frida Kleinstock Blankenberg here. You've got uh, Margaret Machen here. Um, a number of these women were members of this organization. Now, I'm certainly not saying that it was because of the professional and business women's organization that motivated them to run for office, but they did what they could to encourage women to do this. They supported, there was an equal rights amendment out at this time that they really worked hard on. Uh, and then they did things like this. This is an article about Miss Nina Hargi, Mrs. Nina Hargi, and she got to act as mayor one day. She was a member in 1932. She got to be mayor for an hour, but I guess an hour is better than nothing. Down here we have another project that this organization was a part of, and that was the Ian Alley Fountain in Bronson Park. And that whole project was sponsored by the Kalamazoo Professional and Business Women's, um, Associate, Women's Club. Philanthropy. Well, when you talk about philanthropy, we're going to go back to this building right here, the Kalamazoo Public Library. Uh, and we are in such an appropriate room to talk about the Van Dusens. And I wanted to bring this up because when you look at philanthropy, fortunately, in this example of philanthropy, we have two people that really shared this honor. And they were ones that um, both were very, very much involved with the kind of philanthropy that they did. This is Edwin and Cynthia Wendover Van Dusen. Um, in all the articles written at the time, it did say that it was together that they gave the money. They were born in the state of New York. Um, I always, when, I, when I was doing research on them, I wanted to find out you know, where did the money come from. They both came from money. Both of their fathers were merchants. Um, her father, in 1870, his personal estate was worth $223,000. Now that was back in 1870. So they both came from money. Um, Edwin attended um, um, a number of schools, eventually went to the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and in 1855 he decided to go into the field of mental health. Uh, he worked in New York, and he was later appointed the first medical superintendent of the Michigan Asylum for the Insane, opening here. Uh, Dr. McNair, in those medical memories of Kalamazoo, uh, said that he used his own funds to equip the wards of the hospital. Um, they, they came here, uh, they married in 1858, just before they came to Kalamazoo. They lived on the grounds of the hospital uh, for the next 20 years. Uh, we do know that they were active with the church. I tried to see if she was a member of the ladies' library, but I could not find um, any evidence that she was, a, she was a member. So I'm not quite sure exactly um, all what she did outside of taking care of the home. They did have two children, one son and one daughter, who unfortunately only lived until she was two years old. Um, after he retired from the hospital in 1878, they moved downtown on South Street and um, got involved. He was on a different commission. He was involved with the Academy of Medicine and um, very interested, I think, you know, what the next stage was going to be. Now, we already talked about the beginnings of the Kalamazoo Public Library. Uh, we'll go back to that building. Um, we talked about the beginnings and the history of the Kalamazoo Public Library when we talked about Flora Roberts. Um, there was a time when the, when the library was open to the public in 1872 that it was housed at Corporation Hall, which was located on Burdick Street. The building is no longer there. And uh, there was serious discussion about the board, um, about uh, they, had a, they had a room, they had a move at one point in time. 
And um, one of the things, the story is that um, they were in the Corporation Hall, then they moved to a building on Main Street, and then they came back, they thought about coming back to Corporation Hall. But the Van Dusens were very concerned. One of the things that they said that they were concerned about is that they noticed that children, the, the Corporation Hall was not only the Village Hall, but it also held jail. And so they were concerned about um, children who were going to the library who were having to pass by or go by this jail. So they really wanted to find a new location. So the board really discussed in 1890 about what they were going to do. They were looking at maybe renting rooms somewhere else. But um, one of the things that Dr. Van Dusen said, there was little more than Mrs. Van Dusen and I could stand when it comes to forcing school children and library patrons to pass up and down the same stairway that was used by criminals, we decided to present the city with a library building, which is what they did. So in July of 1890, the announcement came out that the Van Dusens were giving the unbelievable sum of $50,000. Um, not only that, but um, Edwin, Dr. Van Dusen and, well, I don't know so much if, if it was Mrs. Van Dusen, but Dr. Van Dusen actually cho chose this site on the corner of South and Rose Street and purchased that piece of property for that. Now, one of the things I've tried to figure out is what's the relative value of $50,000 um, in today's money? And it definitely was several million dollars. Um, the site was purchased for $15,000, so it's even getting more. So you've got, got $65,000 that they gave. Now, the sole condition was that there was going to be a room set aside for the Kalamazoo Academy of uh, Medicine. And uh, they also felt strongly about having reading rooms. Now, this I thought was very, very interesting, and this came from both of the Van Dusens. It was said in the paper, their very general use may be encouraged and that all who use them may find opportunities, comforts, and conveniences as are found in private club rooms for the city. So they wanted to make sure that if you were a working person, that the library would present that same sort of atmosphere as if you were in a private club. The other thing is they wanted to make sure that the reading room was opened on Sunday afternoons because so many of these workers were working Monday through Saturday. They were working six days. So the Van Dusens really wanted to make sure that this space was gonna be available for everybody. They chose the architect, uh, Patton and Fisher. Uh, the builder was U.D. Wheaton. And uh, the cost of the building actually increased and the Van Dusens made up for that. Uh, the eventual cost was $75,000. Um, that included all the interior decoration, the marble, the wood, everything else like that. Uh, they did not want uh, their, their name on the building. Um, in fact, there wasn't really a big celebration when the building was completed. Um, it just opened the doors and just operated like any normal day. Uh, they were very, uh, Dr. Van Dusen, they had a children's room. In fact, I've been told that the entrance to the children's room was over here. Um, he didn't mind that the children's room was named after him, and so the children's room was known as the Van Dusen Children's Room. And it was said that uh, sometime, uh, one time he said, he said about this, he spent a lot of time down there, and he said, I hate to leave this room more than any other part of the library. So, uh, so they allowed the children's room to name, be named after them, but not the entire library. Now their philanthropy increased and continued. They supported Bronson Hospital. They also supported um, St. Luke's Episcopal Church. And uh, they actually moved to New York. They pa when they passed away, they eventually were buried here in Kalamazoo. But it was said, um, all of this good was done quietly and without show. So when they gave the money, they wanted to make sure that it was done quietly and not a lot of publicity. So the Van Dusens. As far as business goes, there's many things I could talk about with business, but this is a woman up here uh, who was in Kalamazoo that has intrigued um, a lot of us, and I, it made several of our lists. And this is Annette Maxson McRae. Now, she was not born in Kalamazoo. She was born in New York, Cooperstown, New York. Um, she had three other sisters and one brother. This is her brother Charles, and he will figure in on the story of Annette. Um, she married a man named J. Franklin McRae, who was a nursery owner. They had two daughters, and they eventually moved to Detroit. Uh, this was around the, 18, around the 1880s. Uh, Franklin McRae owned what was called J. Frank McRae and Company. It was the largest nursery business in the area. And uh, actually, it was earlier. It was the 1870s, because in 1877, Charles, Annette's brother, came to Detroit to work for his brother-in-law. 
Unfortunately, uh, Franklin, Annette's uh, husband, uh, was in ill health. They moved a lot. They eventually found their way to Denver. And um, he passed away uh, in 18, uh, let's see, what did I have here, 1892. He died in Denver of heart failure. And she came back to Kalamazoo. Charles was here. Her husband was buried at Mount Home Cemetery. And she had a family to support. So what was she going to get involved with? Well, her brother was involved with the landscape business, so Annette started getting involved with landscape architecture. She started doing this um, around the same time in 1892, and it said that her first official commission was, now you may not recognize this, but it's Henderson Park. Um, it was at that same time, and I'm looking up Grand Avenue here, okay? So in, when Frank Henderson had a crew together that was brought together to plat and plan the landscape development that became known as the West Main Hill neighborhood, Annette, McCray was, Annette Max and McCray was involved with that. And uh, so she has called herself, and other people have called her, the first professional women's landscape architect. Um, she will go back to her picture. Uh, eventually, she decided to move to Chicago. She moved there in the late 1890s. And uh, she was hired as a consulting architect for Lincoln Park uh, in 1900. And uh, then what she became, she did a lot of landscape architecture up in Marquette, Michigan, at Northern Michigan, um, up at Houghton at Michigan Tech, or at that time it was the Michigan School of Mines. Uh, Charles remained here in Kalamazoo. Um, Annette had lived on Stewart Street, as did Charles. Um, eventually, and this is a real blurry postcard, but over here in the corner, one of the things that Annette became involved with was landscaping train stations. And so she worked for a number of railroads in the state of Illinois um, in beautifying the land around the train stations. Uh, she also, it was said, um, also um, was involved with convincing schools to incorporate classes on landscape architecture because she saw that as a profession that women specifically could go into. Uh, she was also involved with the Equal Suffrage Association. Uh, there, were, uh, there was several publications at that time. Uh, there was one publication called Vocations for Girls that was, came out in 1913 and it talked about the kinds of things that Annette had worked on. And uh, she ascribed her success to the indomitable perseverance and faith in herself. Um, and uh, eventually passed away in 1928 and was buried at Mount Home Cemetery, not far from where this, was where this is located. When you also look at business, the one company, the Kalamazoo Corset Company, played a very, very big role when you look at employment of women. I love this photograph. Um, I probably stretched it too high. Uh, but this was taken um, around 1910. Uh, comes from the collection of the Kalamazoo Public Library. Uh, and you get a feeling of what it was like to work in the corset company. Now the course, Kalamazoo Corset Company began earlier as the Featherbone Corset Company, moved to Kalamazoo in 1891. And it had been in Three Oaks. And the feature of this was that they were using turkey quills, or feather, turkey feather quills, to make the corset stays. Um, they built, now this is a much later picture, this was taken in the 1930s, uh, but it was on the corner of Church and Eleanor Street. And uh, this factory building was built uh, between 1894, uh, there were two other buildings that were built, and by 1906 they were producing 1.5 million corsets per year. That's a lot of turkey feathers. Um, in 1910, when around the time that these photographs were taken, there were 931 workers, 788 were women. So by far, it was a predominantly feminine, uh, feminine um, industry. Now, it wasn't the only place that you saw women working in Kalamazoo. Uh, just, about, just about every other business you had women, even in the paper industry you had women uh, who were sorting rags and doing things there. Um, they're, what they were getting paid, uh, they worked six days a week. The men were getting paid 14 to $20 a week. The women were getting paid eight to $11 a week. For the most part, they were single women under the age of 30. Well, one of the things that happened in 1912, now these come from the collection at Western. Uh, this comes from the archives, and these were part 
of a legal suit, a legal uh, case that was done after what happened in 1912. And what happened in 1912 is we had a four month strike. Uh, the women, um, there were 500 members of the International Ladies and Garment Workers, Asso Workers Union Local 82. They struck for poor wages. Law, they, they were striking because of poor wages, long hours, unsanitary, unsanitary working conditions, and sexual harassment. They had to pay for the thread to make the corsets, and it was said that the foreman would give them um, a better deal on the thread, uh, and I won't go any further than that. We'll leave it there. Um, these were photographs that were, um, as you can see, exhibits in this case that happened after because there were national leaders that came in uh, during the court. But you can see uh, these were some of the pickets. Uh, they also did something different. Uh, they held, when, when the court said that uh, they tried to stop them from picketing, uh, they held silent picketing or prayer meetings. Uh, the strike ended on June 15, 1912. Uh, the company was reorganized in 1915. Um, it existed in Kalamazoo under a couple different names um, until 1956, and the buildings came down in the 1970s. So women working in Kalamazoo. Arts, music, and photography. Madam Janice Short. This is Anna Janice Short, Deanst, but she, um, for most of her life, she was known as Anna Janice Short. Um, quite a very unique uh, individual in Kalamazoo. Uh, she was actually born in Germany, came with her parents, uh, Charles and Emily Janish, um, when she was about a year old, and they settled in Kalamazoo. Uh, Charles was a gunsmith. Um, it was said that he had made 2,620 guns by the time he was done building guns. He was also a notary public, a justice of the peace, and an agent for a steamship line in an insurance company. His building was on East Michigan in the uh, Haymarket Historic District. Uh, he had six children. Now, um, Anna was educated in the Kalamazoo Public Schools. She graduated in 1867, and she immediately became a teacher. And from 1868 to 1878, for that 10-year time period, she taught at what was known as the Colored School, which existed on the north side, and it was a segregated school for students who were African American. Uh, she then taught, um, we know that um, she was teaching music, uh, beginning probably even into the 1860s, she was beginning music. But she continued to teach for the Kalamazoo Public Schools um, in, through the 1870s. The school was located, um, as I said, in a separate building on the north side, it eventually moved to what was known as the Frank Street Building. But in the 1880s, the city directory, about 1885, has her now teaching piano and organ at 228 East Main Street, uh, where she lived there with her, with her husband, Frederick Short. Now this is another mystery about, about Anna Janice Short that I find interesting, is that she and her sisters had a hyphenated last name. Um, her sisters did the same thing. Uh, and this is, you know, you, you see that a lot in more recent years, but here we have it back in the 1880s that her sisters are doing Janish, Dash, and then whatever their last name is. And in this case, it was Janish Short. Um, in 1889, and this is what I absolutely love, in 1889 in the city directories and in her ads, she begins to identify herself, and even in the newspaper, as Madam Janish Short. Madam Janish Short. Uh, she taught, uh, she started her, her music institute, and she built a new building in 1902. Now what you see here uh, is a brochure about it. Here you have the building right here. Here are some interior photographs um, of the building. This is the orchestra hall, or the, the performance hall, the auditorium that was on the second floor. You can see this piece of furniture here that they had. This was their library. Um, she advertised that she could teach piano, organ, violin, violoncello, ba bass, viola, clarinet, cornet, I gotta take a breath, flute, piccolo, slide trombone, drums, mandolin, guitar, banjo, and banjo reno. So very talented individual. And you can see up here, she's got Music Institute, Madame Janice Short. This building was completed around 1902. Here is another view of the music hall. And, um, 
she was still teaching up until 1924. Her husband Frederick had died in 1903. And the year later, I love this. I love what you can find in the newspaper. And we have this database at the archives of the Kalamazoo Gazette between 1872 and 19, um, 1922. And uh, in 1904, I love it, there was an article where she denied going to marry William Fish. The rumors were that she was marrying him. She said, and I quote, I have had several suitors, but this one is a mere kid. She's 55, he's 46, he's a mere kid. And she said, besides, I would never marry a flute player. So I love it. <laughs> and it's in the Kalamazoo Gazette. Um, she, she did marry, remarry a doctor uh, about seven years after this building was completed, a doctor Andrew Deanst of Kansas, but within two years she asked for a divorce. So that didn't really last all that long and he did not like Kalamazoo. He wasn't very happy with the community. Uh, she continued to teach until 1924. She died that year in her apartment here and um, this is the building as it looks today on East Michigan Street. Uh, there was a big train when I took this picture, so I wasn't, and, and you know, I, I really do appreciate Beth giving me this opportunity, but I did not want to stand in the middle of the street to get a very better view. And if you've been down East Michigan, you will understand that, you understand that. This is the south, this is the south side of East Michigan, just to the east of um, Edwards Street. And you can still see that very distinctive cornice um, it has been painted. The lyre and the other decorations up here have been painted. The really neat thing about this building, there, was, there have been several articles written about it that the second floor, which is living space, still continues to have that skylight, that octagonal skylight. I was up there one time. It's just the most incredible space up there. Her will went into specific, specific um, discussion as far as what she wanted her funeral to be. Uh, she made arrangements for the, her own casket. She requested what dress she would be buried in, what she would wear on her head. She said that she wanted a brass band to head the funeral procession. Um, she left an estate. She usually dressed in black. The one thing that she said on the will, which was great, and it did happen, she wanted her tombstone to say, Madam Janice Short. And that's what it says. Uh, she and her husband, her first husband, are buried up at Riverside next to her parents, and it's Madame Janish Short. Um, what an individual. I, uh, there was a woman who spent many years working here uh, as a librarian, Marjean Gladys, and her mother had actually taken lessons from Madame Short. And why I didn't talk with her, you know, you always think, oh, those people are going to be around all the time. And, uh, the one thing she did say was that she always wore black, and I think you were able to see that from the first photograph that we saw there, um, Madam Janice Short. This house has always intrigued me in the Vine neighborhood. This is on the corner of Vine and South Row Street. And, um, I, you know, when you talk about women in Kalamazoo that, you know, I, you know this thing, it's, it's the house that interested me more, and you're always trying to figure out why does this house here have this right here? Okay. Um, if you look at Faye Hendry's book, Outdoor Sculpture in Kalamazoo, which came out a number of years ago in 1980, one thing it does say, is what it identifies this as, is it talks about that this is a copy of Luca della Robbia's Cantoria, the organ loft, for the cathedral in Florence, Italy. And that this was the singer's gallery, and that there was a panel here, and there was also a panel in the house. It says that it was the home of an opera singer. So what am I going to do? I'm going to try to find out who was that opera singer. Here's a detail of that on the front of the house. So this is a copy. The originals are in the museum that are behind the cathedral in Florence. Well, here is the opera singer. I wish I had some photos of her, but this is the best I can do. These are clippings about Pearl Thayer Laurie. Now see, here's another woman that decided to keep that maiden name right there. Uh, Pearl was born in 1897 um, in Wisconsin. Uh, she married and came to Kalamazoo. She married William Laurie, who was an accountant. Uh, they were originally living on Academy Street. Now, William Laurie came here in 1916, uh, worked as a clerk, later an accountant, later a general manager, and married Pearl around 1919. The house that we were looking at was built, well, 
it was it was there in 1931. It was not there in 1929. We don't have a city directories. The night the because of the depression uh, and other factors, we don't have a straight set of city directories from the 1930s. So it could have been 1930 or 1931. And it was originally built by a man named William for William Glassman, uh, who was from the Ealing Brothers Everhard Company, and um, in in the Mission Revival style. So the Lorries, uh, Pearl and her husband William, moved there, oh, around 1935. They were there like 35, 36, 37, around in that area. So the mid-1930s. They weren't really in the house all that long. Uh, Pearl uh, worked at the Kalamazoo Conservatory of Music. Uh, she also did a lot of singing um, in Chicago, uh, different operas that she would perform, different, different groups that she would perform in. Um, she was the choral director um, at a church. She worked at the Uptown Music Studio. And eventually the Lorries moved out in 1945. Now they had moved from the house. They may have only been there for about three or four years, but long enough that we've got evidence of them there. Uh, so another unknown Kalamazoo woman. Oh, and I've got to include Mamie Austin. If you had been here about a year ago, I talked about photographers in Kalamazoo. And I talked about this woman. This is Mamie Austin. Um, Mamie Austin was actually born in Waterbury in 1887. Her father was a photographer. And you can see that I love these pictures. These pictures are, actually came to us through another collection at the archives. But we were able to figure out who exactly they were. And we've got George Austin's name here. These were taken that long after they came to Kalamazoo in 1900. And George came to take over a photographic studio. Mamie was about 12 or 13 at the time. Um, they, um, she went, I, I have no evidence as far as where she went to school, um, if she went to Kalamazoo or not. I'm assuming that she did. And um, you look in the social columns of the Kalamazoo Gazette and she went to various functions, various showers. But by the time she was 25, she went to go work for her father at the studio. Uh, around 1912. And at the time of his death in 1923, she took over the operations of the photographic studio. Um, she was there at the, at the studio probably until around 1931, so for about eight years. And by 1934, she was home. In 1936, she was working somewhere else. And where that somewhere else was, was the Kalamazoo Public Library. Now, this is a photo that was taken many years later. But Mamie, when Mamie came in to the library in the 1930s, she began to work at the library under the Works Progress Administration program. And she worked in the art department. One of the things that she did is she, was, she became known for many, many years as the movie lady. And I should say that this was one of the services that Flora Roberts started, the movie program here at the Kalamazoo Library. And so she would, take, she would show not only movies at the library, but then she would take these movies to the various schools uh, to show them there. But her work at the Kalamazoo Public Library also included where she was able to tap into her talents as a photographer. And at the library, um, in the local history room, there's a number of her photographs that she took. Now, the reason why Mamie took these was the art department had a image file, a picture file that you might remember that you could check out pictures um, and for a certain amount of time and use them for what you did. And, and Mamie's emphasis was, of course, Kalamazoo. Between 1936 and 1939, the uh, local history room has 120 photographs left of her work. We don't know exactly how many photographs she took. They don't really reveal that in the minutes. Um, the majority of these, 75% of them, were from industry. So you see she was taking these pictures for classrooms, for presentations, whatever. Uh, this is the Kalamazoo Stove Company. And it really, I feel, shows her talent as a photographer, the way that she was able to capture the lighting as they're pouring into these molds. Um, this is the Kalamazoo Sled Company. I love how you have, I, I, she probably didn't even think about this, but when you see the details up here, here's the calendar up here. So you've got some dating going on in there. Uh, so the first batch of photographs that she did, the majority of them were industry and manufacturing. So she did a batch from 1936 to about 1939. Then there's another batch from about 1940 to 43. So you've got 
about a mm, seven year time span that Mamie's taking these photographs. It is such a valuable resource as far as documenting life in Kalamazoo during this time period. It's absolutely priceless. And I don't think we've ever found the negatives. We've got the prints, but I don't think we've ever found the negatives. They may not have even saved the negatives. This is the infant welfare station, which was located at the intersection of Gull and I think it's Ransom and Harrison. If you know where the food co-op and Mackenzie's Bakery is, it was on the other side of that street. There was a little piece of property that was here. It was a place that was established for mothers to go and learn how to take care of their babies, what to feed them. Uh, but it was also a place where people would gather while people were probably there. It was a very, very small building. And another one that I absolutely love, this is the only image that we ever found of the Kalamazoo Municipal Market, the Farmer's Market. Not when it was on Bank Street, but when it was on Mill Street, the site previous to the Bank Street Market. And this just goes on and on and on. The buildings that she did, the schools, um, just incredible as far as providing a documentary, a document of, a, a visual document of life in Kalamazoo in the 30s and the 40s. Very, very valuable. We don't know how many total she, ta she took. We don't know how many are gone, but we are so grateful that we have what we have from Mamie Austin. Lydia Siegelock. I've included Lydia Siegelock here because when you're looking at music and art and photography, she really did have an impact on, at least with Western, and even a little impact on what was going on in Kalamazoo. Lydia was born in Flint. Uh, she worked in Buchanan, Michigan. She taught art. She had received her two-year certificate from Western State Normal School. Um, and uh, she worked at Battle Creek. And she eventually came to Western, uh, taught in the training school in uh, 1921 to 1922, and then got into the art department. And she was there from 1922 to 1955. She eventually got uh, college degrees from the Art Institute of Chicago, and she got a master's degree from Columbia. Um, she took a lot of trips around, and uh, one of the things that Lydia was involved with not only was teaching art, but she was also involved with decorating and planning the furnishings in a lot of the buildings at Western. Uh, she was in the chair of the House Decorating and Furnishing Committee. And when you look at the list of between 1936 and 1962, she was involved with 33 buildings on Western's campus, 13, including 13 dorms on campus. This is Siege, the, um, I think this is Siege Log. Um, and you can see she was involved with, she would, she would purchase things for decoration. So it wasn't just, here are the curtains, here are the tables, whatever. But she took a lot of care. She did a lot of traveling. Here's a photograph here, over here in the left-hand corner here, of some of the things that she purchased. Uh, some of which are in storage right now that you can't really go to a dorm that she did and, find, and, and see if you could look at it. She felt that, it, that art was not just art for art's sake, but it was also a practical thing. Uh, she was also a practical notion, and she was also involved with um, gathering, her, some of her students were involved with the stained glass windows at Canley Chapel, and this picture was taken during the dedication. Uh, Lydia was also involved with, ah, Lydia was also involved with the Kalamazoo Professional and the Kalamazoo Business and Professional Women's Organization, and she also played a role in the um, bringing Alfonso Ianelli to design the Fountain of the Pioneers in Bronson Park. So she was very much involved um, with that. I could go on and on and on this morning, or this morning, this evening. Yeah, see, I could go on till all morning uh, because there are so many women out there that. Uh, this is just the beginning. We have women that played roles in education. Over here in this corner here, oh, we have Mary Ensfield right here who was a county superintendent for many, many years. We have another Upjohn, but she was an Upjohn through marriage. This is Millie Kirby Upjohn who married Henry Upjohn. Very interesting story about her because after she got married, she decided to go to me uh, medical school herself so she could practice with her husband. And one of my favorites, because one of the things that we have at the archives is a numerous amount of diaries and letters written by women. And this was a diary that I got to read, a woman named Ella Rogers, who came to Kalamazoo to, um, after her husband died 
to um, live with her brother. And she decided in her 50s to go back to Western and became a teacher and taught um, at a school with her daughter. There are so many women out there that played a role in the history of our community that, as I said, you can make that Fascinating Women Part 1 and continue to do Fascinating Women Part 2. But that's for another time period. All right. Thank you very much.